Let's discuss determining the charge of ions and ionic compounds. Monatomic, meaning single atom metals, are cations, positively charged. Monatomic, singly charged nonmetals are anions, negatively charged. Recall the common charges for monatomic ions. And let me go to the periodic table and we'll just remind ourselves of that. We agreed that group one are going to be all positive one monatomic cations. Group two are going to be positive two monatomic cations. Over on the other side in the nonmetals, these monatomic ions gain electrons to form anions. We agreed that nitrogen and phosphorus, when in monatomic state, will predictably be negative three. Oxygen sulfur will be negative two. And fluorine, chlorine, bromine iodide will be negative one. Number four, transition and inner transition metals are not predictable, and some have multiple charge states, although all these charge states are not simultaneous. So, let me go to the periodic table and we'll try to understand what that means. Okay, so here are the inner transition metals and there are the transition metals. Now, unlike group one and group two, these transition metals, along with some of these main group metals here, can exist in multiple charged states. And it's important that we appreciate that they cannot be in multiple charged states simultaneously. What I mean is, for example, iron can exist as a positive 3 or a positive 2. Copper could exist as a positive 1 or a positive 2. Lead could exist as a positive 2 or a positive 4. And there are other variations of the transition metals and the inner transition metals and these other few metals here in the main group. We really can't predict them. We can only analyze a formula and then determine what the charge is on those metals. Number five, with the exception of hydronium ion H3O plus and ammonium ion NH4 plus, polyatomic ions we will deal with are anions. In other words, they're going to be negatively charged collections of atoms. What I want to do now is take a look at some formulas and predict the charges of the ions in the formulas. So if we had this compound here, sodium and chloride, you recognize first that this is an ionic compound because of the metal, non-metal generalization. Metal, sodium, non-metal chlorine. In this case, chloride. <clears throat> if we understand that it's an ionic compound, then we must appreciate that each of these components, the cation and the anion, will have positive and negative charges on them. Now it's our job right now to determine what those charges are. Well, I hope this one's pretty straightforward because if we agree that for all compounds sodium is going to be a positive one and we've seen that we could predict chlorine to be a negative one, we pretty much accomplished our goal here. The charge on sodium is going to be plus one and the charge on the chloride is going to be negative one. And the important thing to appreciate that collectively their charges, if you add up their charges, equal zero. And they have to equal zero because the charge represented on the formula of the compound is zero. Note there's no charge written anywhere around this formula. So 
the sum of the charges of the individual ions must sum up to zero. Let's take another sort of straightforward one. Sodium fluoride. Well, we've agreed that sodium is going to be positive one. And by deductive reasoning, because there's one sodium and one fluoride, the fluoride has to be negative one. Why is that? Because we only have one sodium and these two charges of the cation and the anion must equal zero because there's no charge written on the formula. So the positive one of the sodium must be canceled out by a negative one from the, f the single fluoride to equal zero. And Another way to verify it is that we agree that sodium is positive one and that fluorine is going to be fluoride because it's in groups, main group seven and it's one away from the noble gases. So it'll pick up one electron to form fluoride. How about magnesium and chloride? This is the correct formula for magnesium chloride. And again, the charge on these formulas that we're going to be writing is zero. Collectively, these ions, the charges on these ions, sum up to zero. So think about this mathematically. If we agree, <coughs> excuse me, that magnesium is a group two metal, and it's always going to be positive two. And we agreed from before that chlorine is going to be negative one then the, there's two chlorides. This two means that there are two individual chloride ions. And each chloride ion has a negative two charge. I mean, excuse me, each chloride ion has a negative one charge. So mathematically, positive two plus two negative ones equal zero. Let's try another one. Calcium. and iodine. Right. Group 2 metal, so it's going to form a positive 2 cation, and we have two iodides. So each of those iodides must be Mathematically, each iodide must be negative one because two negatives will cancel out the two positives, just like in the previous formula. Positive two plus two negative ones equal zero. Just as a reminder, we're seeing the generalization here to recognize these formula as ionic compounds. Metal, non-metal. Metal, non-metal. Metal, non-metal, non and metal, non-metal. That's the tip-off to help you recognize if it's an ionic formula or an ionic compound and know how to deal with it appropriately. All right, let me erase these, and we'll try some more. about iron and oxygen. Oh, again, collectively, no charge written on the formula, and we won't see that. When we write a complete ionic formula, we'll not be seeing any charges. So the sum of the charges on the iron and the oxygen must equal zero. 
ionic compound because we see metal, non-metal. Now we have iron. Iron is a transition metal with multiple charge possibilities. Now, question is, what is that charge on the iron? Well, while, I'm this, while I'm writing this down, I want you to think about what you learned for oxygen and what anion we predicted for oxygen. We know iron is going to be positive because it's a metal and it's going to form a cation because it's a metal. Now, what charge does oxygen form when it forms an anion? The prediction was it's always going to be a negative 2. Okay, mathematically, we'll just write a little x here. What positive x number plus the negative 2 charge that we have here will equal zero. Well, simple math says that, well, that x has got to be a positive 2. Now, it's important to appreciate that there is one iron and one oxide. One iron ion and one oxide ion in this formula. Here's another example of iron. In this case, we have two irons and three oxides. Ionic compound, so predict the formula on the iron. Put a two here because we understand that there's two of them, and there's there are three oxides, and we agree that the oxide is always going to be two negative. All right. Well, let's do some math here. We have two of an unknown. I'm just going to write that x, and this unknown is x means whatever that charge is on each iron. We have two of them. We have two irons, and we're representing the charge of each iron as x. We add that positive charge to our negative collection from oxide, which is three negative twos. Well, three negative twos is negative six. The contribution of oxide in this formula is a negative 6. All, right. All of this contributes negative 6. All right. And we agree that the collection of all the charges must equal 0. So let's do the math. We'll draw it completely out. 2x, if we add 6 to both sides, we get 2x equals, oops, 6, got to write, write, yeah, erase this. Add 6 to both sides. Now x equals 3. So the answer to this question, what's the charge on each iron? Each iron is, is a positive 3. Over here, each iron was a positive 2. This is a stable compound with its formula. This is another different stable compound with its formula. In this case, iron is positive 2. In this case, iron is positive 3. Now, iron cannot, is not swapping back and forth, as we all understand it, between positive 2 and positive 3. 
it's either going to be one or the other and that's the way we'll treat all of our transition and intertransition metals. So let's try a few more about copper. Get my pencil back. Copper is always a fun one. Copper with one oxygen and copper with two coppers with one oxygen. How's that? Analyze the charge on the copper for each of these compounds. Right? We agree again that each oxygen is going to be negative 2. So we have one oxygen or one oxide for each of these formulas. So we'll just write one oxide and here we have one copper. And it's going to be positive because it's a metal. So the prediction here would be it would be copper 2 plus. Here, we make the same prediction with oxygen as being oxide with a negative 2. Now, in this case, we have two coppers with some unknown positive charge. Well, hopefully you'll be able to see this right off the bat and say, well, hmm, if I have two coppers and I have one oxide and the sum of these charges must equal zero, each copper therefore must be positive one. Well, let's go through the math just to verify that. X is my unknown charge on each copper plus the negative two on the single oxide and they both must sum up to be equal to zero. Adding two to both sides I get 2x equals 2. Therefore x or the unknown charge or the charge on each copper is positive 1. So in this case we have copper with a positive 1. Two different stable compounds of copper. One has copper positive two, and the other one has copper positive one. Let's try a few more. Let's get rid of these. Let's try some with polyatomic ions. And let me get my pen back. Let's look at lead PB with the sulfate polyatomic ion. SO4. Hmm. Well, how do we deal with this? Well, we have to appreciate that sulfate is a collection of atoms, and that collection has a charge on it it's important to appreciate not to break up the SO4. Keep it all as one little collection of charge. And also appreciate that most of the time our metals, our cations are going to be metals and they're going to be monatomic species. So we're just going to rewrite our cation or a metal as one item, which is justifiably so. And right now we have to figure out what that positive charge is. So what do we do? Well, sulfate was one of the polyatomic ions I would expect you to remember or just memorize as far as the charge goes. So a sulfate, if you don't remember it, you didn't memorize it, you can look at your table in your book for now, but try to keep it in your mind, is negative 2. 
Now, I'm going to rewrite this like this. SO4, all of it together. All of it together has a negative 2 on it. Right. Do not think of the negative 2 as only being associated with the oxygens. or one. It, it doesn't work that way. This may be a little bit confusing because we may have saw, oh, well, oxide, oxygen is negative 2. Keep it separate. Keep that idea separate. And keep this idea that the polyatomic ion sulfate collectively has a negative 2 charge on it. With that said, we could go about analyzing this with a little bit more ease, I would imagine. So if we agree that the sulfate all together, the one sulfur and the four oxygen together have a negative 2 on it, we can do a little math here. Say, okay, what's this unknown charge on the lead? added to that negative 2 charge on the sulfate. Together they must equal 0. Well, I hope now you can appreciate that the charge on the lead is positive 2. It's Pb2+. Plus. Let's try another one with lead. Pb SO4. <clears throat> We're going to have two sulfates. And the question is, what's the charge on the lead? Well, again, if you remember that the charge on each sulfate is going to be negative 2, then we have two sulfates. Now the question is, what's the charge on the lead? Hmm. Well, there's the charge on the lead, and we'll draw that as x. And here we have two negative twos. And collectively, they must equal zero. So you can see, x minus four is equal to zero. Therefore, the x must be positive four. Therefore, this is lead four. So we write it as Pb four plus. Now oh, let's try a few more. Let me erase this. And we'll try How about this one here. This one should be pretty straightforward, I would even assume. PBCL4. Going back a little bit here. Chloride, we have four chlorides, and each chloride is a negative one. Therefore, the charge on the lead is going to be what positive number? Four. PB4. Why is that? Because there's four negative ones. So these four chlorides contribute negative four, and therefore this one lead must be a positive four. Let's try this one here.
In this case, we have lead phosphate. All right? Phosphate was one of the polyatomic ions I wanted you to remember. And if you remember that phosphate has on a collectively a negative three. Or think of it as phosphate as one group of atoms, all with a negative three on it. Right? Okay, if we have that information, that means we have four phosphates that four this four comes up here communicating to us that we have four phosphate polyatomic ions and then we have to figure out what the charge is on our each lead oops get rid of that that was a mistake get my pen back Okay, so we have three leads, so the charge on each lead is going to be x plus four negative threes. So, and that must sum up to equal zero. So three x minus twelve equals zero. So mathematically we'll go through the whole process. We'll add 12 to both sides. And we'll divide both sides by 3. And we'll get x equals positive 4. Get that positive there. So PB 4. So here's a compound with lead 4, and here's another compound with lead 4. Let's try one more. We'll use gold. Let me get rid of this. All right. Let me get my pen back. And we'll try some gold compounds. How about this one here? Gold and chloride. And there's three chlorides. So what's the charge on the gold? The cation. So there's gold, and I'm going to put a question mark with a positive. You know it's positive because it's a metal. And we have three chlorides. And the charge on each chloride is negative one. And that charge on the gold plus the three negative ones on the chloride must equal zero. So mathematically, x minus three equals zero. So x must equal positive 3. So in this case, gold has a positive 3 charge on it. What about this one here? Gold fluoride. Hmm. Gold and fluoride together. Let's see. Well, this time we only have one fluoride. We have one gold. We agree that the charge on the fluoride is going to be negative one. And we have one gold with some unknown charge on it. Positive, though. I hope this one's pretty straightforward for you. We have 
the unknown charge on the gold plus the negative one charge from the single fluoride and that must equal to be zero so gold is going to have a positive one charge on it interesting we have two different compounds in one compound gold is positive three and the other compound gold is positive one let's try one more gold how about this one here gold and sulfate we need to add some numbers here in the subscripts this is 2 and this is 3 okay we have two golds with some unknown positive charge and we have three sulfates each sulfate has a negative two so looking at this mathematically there's two golds plus three sulfates which each have a negative two and collectively they must be equal to zero so if you haven't guessed already we'll go through it 2x minus 6 equals zero adding 6 to both sides and so now solving for x x equals positive 3 so in this case gold is in the compound as a positive 3 cation